Uh, good evening. Uh, tonight I'm going to advance an argument about citizenship and democracy in Australia with respect to the so-called Freedom Wars, specifically the battle over Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act. I think to, that to understand what's at stake in the 18C debate, the relevant issues need to be put into historical context. An initial way of doing this is to review how the relationship between church and state is altered by the operation of anti-discrimination law, something that you've already heard from the bishop this evening. My starting point, therefore, is that the forces threatening religious freedom in Australia are a straw in the wind regarding threats to, civil, regarding threats to the civil freedoms of the non-religious alike. This is because the political objectives that lie behind any discrimination law are an equal opportunity destroyer of freedoms that traditionally have been taken for granted in a democratic country like Australia. Much of the debate in Australia about religion and the separation of church and state is usually based on a misunderstanding or misrepresentation of the Constitution. Section 116 of the Commonwealth Constitution states, the Commonwealth shall not make any law for establishing any religion or for imposing any religious observance or for prohibiting the free exercise of any religion and no religious test shall be required as a qualification for any office or public trust under the Commonwealth. Secularists assert that the meaning of this section is that religion is to have no place in the public square in the political life of the nation because of the threat religious values are believed to pose to civil freedoms in a democratic society. I think this militant secularist reading of the intent of the Constitution goes too far and misinterprets the liberal principles of religious freedom that underpinned the making of the Constitution. Rather than illegitimising religion as a social and moral force, the real purpose of Section 116 was to prevent the state from restricting freedom to worship and practise one's religion. The Federal Fathers knew their history. They had learned the lessons of the long history of religious persecution in Europe, which had occurred when one official faith held a monopoly over the power of the state and thus over religious belief. To make it clear that the new Australian nation was to be a new world society, free from the old world divisions of class, creed and bigotry, Section 116 was designed to ensure there would be no established religion here. There would be no state monopoly that would invite religious persecution and which would create social and political divisions that would undermine the liberal I ideal of a common Australian citizenship with equal rights and responsibilities for all. This formulation sought to suppress religious difference while extending the maximum of religious liberty. Drawing this line between church and state involved a tricky balancing act. It's important to point out that these liberal principles of citizenship were not entirely to the liking of either the Protestant or the Catholic churches because religion was hereby granted a somewhat ambiguous status. The liberal formulation of the relationship between church and state not only relegated religion to something of a private matter, but also classified religion as a sectional interest that needed to be sublimated to what were thought the true obligations of citizenship, the pursuit of the public good, aka the national interest, through the fulfilment of the civic duties of a good citizen in a democracy. The concern here was to prevent sectarian conflict, as well as to ensure that no special privileges or disabilities under the law was attached to any sect or section of the community that would detract from the common democratic rights of all citizens. The best manifestation of the liberal ideals of citizenship that once animated the civic life of Australians is provided by an organisation called the, Victorian Natives Associ the Australian Natives Association which was um, a Victorian-based organisation which was devoted to what was then called the mutual improvement of its members through educational and other activities. The natives, as the members of the, of the ANA were referred to, practised the ideal of a common citizenship devoted to a higher public good by leading the campaign for federation. Religious motives and motifs, self-sacrifice, service and devotion to a higher calling hereby found temporal expression and civic outlet. However, in fulfilment of their civic ideal, the natives banned all discussion of religious doctrine and theology, being all too aware of the divisive potential of these subjects 
and their potential to divert citizens from their civic duty. How difficult the liberal formulation of citizenship was for the status of the churches was best demonstrated by the extended controversy over school education that began in the late 19th century. The withdrawal of state aid from religious schools was meant to definitively define the relationship by church, between church and state in a disestablishment direction by elevating the ideal of a transcendent citizenship above private matters of faith. The higher purpose here was to transform the free, secular and compulsory public schools by dint of moral instruction and rote learning of the three R's into the makers of good citizens. The withdrawal of state aid for denominational schools and the pursuit of a common citizenship through public education was a singular event that by the time of Federation had given religion its ambiguous, resolutely disestablished position in Australian public life. Nevertheless, there were some obvious benefits for the churches compared to what came before in Europe due to the liberal determination to protect religious freedom. The constitutional provisions provision forbidding the Commonwealth for making laws prohibiting the free exercise of religion left the churches free to practice their, faith, their faiths and govern their communions as they wished. It also enabled the churches to participate in the public square, but only on the strictly disestablishment terms of the liberal democratic state. The constitutional guarantee of freedom of religion, and thus of two more of the four freedoms, namely freedom of conscience and freedom of association, was a virtue of the liberal state that was not to be taken for granted. The Constitution's enlightened attitude towards religious liberty was and remains a national achievement given the long history of intolerance elsewhere. The reason we're here tonight is that the old formulations of the relationship between church and state and between citizenship and religion are breaking down as a new form of secular intolerance has arisen which is rendering the churches no longer free to be left alone by the state. Since the 1970s, the idea of a common citizenship has given way before the principle of diversity and the rise of identity politics. Where we used to talk about the collective rights and responsibilities of citizens, civic and political life has become dominated by discussion of the rights of women, the rights of ethnic minorities, and the rights of gays and lesbians. A conversation which is often started and sustained by taxpayer-funded advocates embedded in various departments of the human rights industry. The legal means of enforcing these rights are the federal and state anti-discrimination laws. My concern is that any discrimination laws combined with the push for marriage equality is in the process of revolutionising the relationship between church and state. Any bill to legalise gay marriage is certain in the first instance to contain faith-based exemptions allowing churches to refuse to perform same-sex marriage. But I wonder how long this concession will last once the marriage equality law is on the books and until the campaign is renewed to remove the exemption consistent with the logic of any discrimination laws. Please note that I don't accuse advocates of gay marriage per se of waging war on religion. My concern, concerns relate to certain groups, most importantly the Australian Greens, which already campaign to remove faith-based exemptions from any discrimination laws for religious schools regarding the employment of gay and lesbian staff. I suspect that the gay marriage issue will be used to advance the militant secularist agenda articulated by the Greens against traditional Christian religions, especially the Catholic Church and also the increasingly popular Pentecostal and Evangelical churches. Note as well that the coupling of marriage equality to anti-discrimination law has the potential to advance the militant secularist cause far beyond keeping religion out of the public square. What is looming is a new form of state monopoly over matters of religious belief and faith, since eradicating the church's secular sins of discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation would represent an extraordinary inter interference in the internal affairs of religious organisations. To dramatise the issue, forcing the successors of Archbishop George Pell to marry a gay couple in front of the altar at St Mary's Cathedral at the barrel end of anti-discrimination law would amount to an unprecedented form of religious persecution, as the state forced nonconformist and dissenters from the theology of state to act against their conscience. If this comes to pass, then the end product of what is claimed to be the great pluralist cause of marriage equality 
would render meaningless the principles of freedom of religion, freedom of association, and freedom of conscience in Australia. You don't need to be religious to be concerned about this. For the record, I'm a lapsed Catholic with no personal, professional, or institutional stake in these issues. Those who should be concerned about the threat to religious freedom are all who are committed to the principle of liberty and to ensuring the proper boundaries between church and state and civil society are observed by the law. Again, for the record, I believe that marriage equality is a matter for the Australian people to, de to determine according to the processes of parliamentary democracy, and I truly have no strong opinions on that subject. But I do feel strongly about the broader cultural issues of militant secularists imposing their left progressive values on the churches. I do oppose this form of creeping totalitarianism and thus support the maintenance of, of the traditional liberal relationship between church and state that respected the freedoms of religion, association and conscience, even if upholding these principles contravenes contemporary anti-discrimination pieties. If religious Australians are not free to follow the dictates of their faith inside their own churches on the question of marriage, Australian society will no longer be able to consider itself a pluralistic society capable of tolerating civil disagreements on moral issues. I acknowledge, and echoing what the Bishop said, that now is not a good time to be defending the rights of the churches, particularly the Catholic Church, to independently govern themselves free of state interference, given the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child abuse. But it remains that some fundamental principles are worth defending. I also think that those who are interested in liberty, particularly those on the centre-right, have a shared strategic interest with the churches. This is because, in a sense, we are all Catholics now when it comes to the politics of anti-discrimination law. The same ideas, the same constellation of political forces, identity politics plus left, progressive, plus less left progressivism plus administrative overreach by the state that threaten freedom of religion, association and conscience also threaten the fourth and most important freedom of all in a democratic society, freedom of speech. This is why it's important as a starting point to appreciate the way that a political agenda, the secularist agenda of delegitimizing traditional Christianity, is being advanced under, under the rubric of anti-discrimination to the detriment of religious liberty. I believe that political objectives also lie behind the origins and operation of anti-discrimination laws in general, and that these political objectives are advanced under the rubric of eradicating so-called offensive speech to the detriment of the democratic rights of all Australians. The debate about Section 18C, initiated by the infamous Andrew Bolt case, is not just about the right to free speech. This has understandably been the main theme of the debate, and of course, in a democratic society, people should be free to say what they wish, because it is a dangerous business for the authorities to get involved in regulating speech. However, the arguments for repeal of Section 18C need to be broadened. It needs to be made clear to the Australian people that at stake over Section 18C is our democratic right to, collect to collectively determine how we are governed through the free discussion of competing ideas. The issue is whether Australians are free to discuss controversial issues and express dissenting views on subjects such as Aboriginal identity and multiculturalism without facing legal action under the Racial Discrimination Act. I want to flesh, this, flesh out this missing context for the 18C debate tonight by considering a couple of examples of how political discussion could be compromised by any discrimination laws with parlous results for the health of Australian democracy and society in general. <coughs> to appreciate how democracy is at risk, we need to review the origins and understand the intellectual and political circumstances surrounding the creation of Australia's hate speech laws. Australia's Racial Discrimination Act, which was introduced in 1975, was based on the British Race Relations Act of 1965. In Britain by the late 1970s, the Race Relations Act was felt not to be working properly because the controversial Tory politician, Enoch Powell, was not able to be prosecuted for making speeches questioning the rationale for mass migration from the former colonies of the British Empire and for, warming of, and for warning of the social and racial tensions mass uncontrolled migration had engendered in British society. Powell was unable to be prosecuted for allegedly stoking racist prejudices against coloured migrants because under the Race Relations Act, it was necessary to prove intent to incite racial hatred. 
Intent was therefore removed as a requirement for prosecution for use, for, for use of threatening, abusive or insulting language, a precedent and precursor to what would become Section 18C in Australia. One of the arguments cited in favour of repeal of Section 18C is that language which incites racial violence will remain a crime in Australia under state and territory criminal statutes. This is dismissed by supporters of Section 18C because their objective, and the objective of hate speech laws in general, is not to preserve the peace so much, but to use the law, or lawfare as it's come to be called, to achieve a political objective, to suppress dissent and reinforce left progressive consensus about controversial race-related political and social issues, a consensus that tends to prevail in much of academia, the media, and most of the political class. The British experience bears this out. The aim of amending the Race Relations Act was to shut down the discussion of the problems associated with immigration sparked by power by establishing a statutory mechanism that would brand as racist those who raise the subject. Note that the threat of potential legal action can be sufficient to deter discussion, and this is the means by which hate speech laws become a political muzzle and enforce the progressive consensus that certain subjects should not be open for discussion. Not only is this legal manoeuvre inherently opposed to free speech, it is also deeply anti-democratic and it is based on the idea that some topics are unfit for, for public discussion and deliberation by the citizenry. The progressive consensus that immigration and the closely related subject of multiculturalism should not be discussed extends to Australia and is also predicated on the belief that discussion will foster racism. I disagree. We should be wary of how the cause of anti-racism is exploited to shut down legitimate debate, given the need to discuss the topics of immigration and multiculturalism as openly as possible. Despite the overwhelming success of Australia's immigration program in the last 60 years, mass migration and multiracial societies remain a grand experiment, a virtually unprecedented experiment until the second half of the 20th century. It is important to periodically assess how the experiment is going to detect and address potential problems. Free discussion of these issues is also important to instill public confidence and create support for immigration. If responsible people and politicians do not talk about these subjects, the danger is that irresponsible people will exploit community concerns. There are many examples in European countries that can be cited to prove these points, for example, the success of the National Front in France. But we don't need to look overseas. During the period of the Keating government in the 1990s, attempts to discuss immigration, multiculturalism and indigenous policy ran up hard against the progressive consensus. The reply by the media, academics and much of the political and many political elites to those who dare raise these subjects in the worst free speech anti-free speech tradition was to say that you can't talk about that because that's racist. With the legislating of section 18C by the Keating government in 1995, the institutional expression of that sentiment. There was indeed a community backlash against the shutting down of debate in the form of the rise to political prominence of Pauline Hanson after the 1996 federal election. The Hanson phenomenon shows that it is politically self-defeating and in fact dangerous to try to suppress free discussion. Nevertheless, this has happened again with respect to the Andrew Bolt case and the same concerns apply to the potential political consequences of suppressing discussion of indigenous identity. Andrew Bolt's offence was to question whether people who identified as Aboriginal but who, may have experienced, but who may not have experienced any discernible disadvantage should be entitled to race-based assistance such as government educational support, preferment in public sector employment and other usually arts-based scholarships. The basic question Bolt was asking was whether race or need should be the criteria for special assistance. Bolt was sued under section 18C by the people he named in his articles who felt offended, insulted and humiliated on the basis of their race. Was there more to this than the hurt feelings of these people? Was there a political agenda designed to shut down debate about this subject behind the decision to target Bolt for prosecution? The reason I believe there was a political agenda is because of the role Andrew Bolt played in the evolution of Indigenous policy more than a decade ago. Louita O'Donoghue was the former head of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, the then peak Indigenous organisation in Australia, and had claimed to be a member of the Stolen Generation. Andrew Bolt was a journalist who wrote the story that uncovered and forced O'Donoghue to admit that she had not been stolen by the authorities in the Northern Territory, 
but had been placed in a mission school by her father. This was a pivotal moment in the history of Indigenous affairs. The discrediting of the most prominent and respected Indigenous leader in the country helped set in train the series of events that eventually led the Howard government to abolish ATSIC. This marked a shift away from the separatist policy that had dominated Indigenous affairs since the 1970s and towards the policies of mainstreaming Aboriginal communities with a view towards full engagement with educational and employment opportunities, a policy shift most definitively signalled by the Northern Territory intervention in 2007. Andrew Bolt played an important part in setting the stage for the Howard government's Indigenous policy revolution, which overturned the progressive consensus in place since the 1970s. I do not think it was a coincidence, therefore, that a successful lawfare campaign was waged to silence Bolt and shut down discussion of Aboriginal identity and entitlement before it could get off the ground. This is a dangerous strategy. According to the Australian Census, increasing numbers of Australians are identifying as Indigenous. I have been surprised in the last couple of months by people, people who can by no means be considered political animals, who have raised in conversation the topic of, to use their words, white people claiming Aboriginal identity to qualify for the associated benefits. Shutting down discussion of Aboriginal identity and entitlements, and by extension of the Bolt case, labelling those who raise the subject as racists, has the potential to build community resentment. Suppressing this debate could set the stage for the issue flaming into prominence in inevitably nasty and divisive ways and in a similar fashion to the Hanson phenomenon. We should fear that the issue may explode, may explode if the proposal to hold a referendum to amend the Commonwealth Constitution to recognise Aboriginal Australians in the preamble is proceeded with because the referendum campaign will concentrate the public mind on the question of who is an Aborigine and what benefits that ought to entitle people to receive and why. Let's consider another hot potato and return to the issue of hate speech laws and discussion of multiculturalism. The major concerns about multiculturalism tend to fall under three major headings. They are that multiculturalism is potentially divisive because it risks, one, importing foreign conflicts into Australia, two, sectional interests subverting national policy, and three, exemptions from the rule of law. There is a need to fully discuss these concerns about the course of multiculturalism in Australia right now. In 2012, the nation witnessed the Sydney protests come right in Hyde Park, which was led by Islamic organisations and sparked by an anti-Islamic film in the United States that had allegedly led to the sack of the American consulate in Benghazi <coughs> and the murder of the US ambassador. This fulfills concern number one. In his diaries released earlier this year, former Foreign Minister Bob Carr explained that former Prime Minister Julia Gillard was rolled in Cabinet in 2012 and Australia abstained on the vote in the United Nations General Assembly on, re on the recognition of Palestine's observer status at the, at the UN based on electoral concerns that the Labor Party would otherwise lose support among Muslim voters in key Labor seats in southwest Sydney. The Cabinet decision overturned decades of bipartisan support for Israel. This fulfills concern number two. In May this year, the ABC reported that Muslim community leaders had held a closed meeting with Deputy Police Commissioner Nick Caldas and had asked him not to enforce the laws that prohibit Australian nationals from fighting in foreign conflicts and not prosecute Muslims who leave Australia to fight in the civil war in Syria. Caldas is slated, slated to become the next New South Wales Police Commissioner. This fulfills concern number three. But is it possible to discuss these issues under the RDA? In 1998, Tom Switzer, the former opinion page editor at the Australian newspaper and current editor of Spectator Australia magazine, was sued under the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Act for racial vilification. His offence was to pen a newspaper column on the Israel-Palestine peace process critical of the Palestinians. The complaint was initially upheld but was overturned on appeal but the need to spend years in court and thousands of dollars on lawyers to exercise your right to free speech has a demonstration effect on others. Rather than court controversy, risk being labelled racist and face legal action, maybe it's easier and cheaper to be silent. The Switzer case deserves to be better known as the Australian Mark Stein case, given the identical travails experienced by that journalist under Canada's now repealed hate speech laws. 
What these cases have illustrated is the chief problem with Section 18C and why it should be abolished. The process is the punishment and politically motivated lawfare makes the price of free speech way too high. All Australians need to understand that hate speech laws give rise to a democratic, democratic deficit. No-go topics unfit for adults to debate in public. This is why the freedom wars are ultimately about democracy. The so-called right of others not to be offended restricts our democratic right to fully and freely discuss subjects of national importance. Hate speech laws are inherently bad for democracy because the only way that democratic institutions acquire legitimacy is by channeling the mind of the public. The way the public mind is formed is by free discussion of issues as different interests compete to shape and define its collective meaning through the political process. Laws restricting free speech are therefore the antithesis of democracy and they represent the end of politics in a free society. Far from religion in the public square being the major threat to civic freedom in Australia, the real threat to all of the four freedoms is posed by those who would use the law for political purposes to enforce the secular pieties of anti-discrimination. The creation of special legal privileges for certain sectional interests undermines the collective democratic rights of our common Australian citizenship and is a state of affairs that would have appalled the Federal Fathers. Thank you. <laughs>